Hello and welcome to a session I'm delivering for Cornwall Teaching School and Sport England. Uh, it's the whole school approach to health and well-being. It's one of the workshops um, being delivered on July the 7th. Um, I'll be available on the day for some question and answers. Um, but this is a pre-recorded session, obviously. Um, I'd like you to be able to view this alongside the actual PowerPoint that I'm presenting. The PowerPoint has a number of slides, uh, a number of solutes, uh, resources connected to those slides, hyperlinked to those slides for you to do your own further reading and research. Um, my name's Jim Rogers, Dr. Jim Rogers. I'm going to introduce myself uh, in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, but the first thing I'd like to do is just go through um, the object objectives for today. Um, I don't I don't have a catchy title for the session. It's using evidence informed strategies for whole school well-being during the recovery phase of COVID-19. Um, just to say that I'm, I'm obviously recording this because I can't be with you on the day. Um, we have a number of priorities in the southwest, which I'll talk about in a moment, but they um, centre around uh, pupil and staff well-being. So I'd like to just establish our starting points in the first part of the session in part one, um, what we can expect from our children uh, as we go through the next phases of school opening, um, understand what the research says about health and well-being and explore some strategies that we can um, just prioritise ourselves and why that's important. Um, we are currently at the time of recording where we're just beginning to open schools for um, year 10, the secondary schools and obviously primary schools have been open now for a couple of weeks for the younger years. Um, we're looking at three potential scenarios I think as we go forward um, if the government reduces uh, reg regulations around social distancing to enable students to work together in school then we may be opening in, in the autumn uh, as business as usual. Um, it could be that we've got a, a kind of um, a, a day on and a day off for children so that they're coming in in, in phases um, and we have obviously the risk of a repeat of a kind of a, a regional spike in, in cases, in which case we could experience further school closures. So we don't know exactly what's going to happen. And I think that in itself is placing additional stress on us as teachers, school leaders uh, and, and heads of department. So... What I want to do is present a case that kind of encompasses all of those different scenarios, but particularly looking at how we can work positively um, moving forwards. So uh, just to introduce myself, um, I work in the Southwest and have done now for a number of years. Um, I've had a career as a, a secondary school teacher and leader. Um, I've worked abroad in, in New Zealand, um, particularly working uh, in sport and schools and, and outdoor education. Um, I've done a lot of work over the last few years with the Teaching School Council, um, Teaching School Council Southwest, uh, running teaching schools. Um, I've run two now uh, in different parts of the Southwest and, and currently have a, a regional role as the Teaching School Council Southwest CPD and Research Lead. And I'll provide a link to their resources uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, I'm fascinated in human performance I'm really really interested in that and what it takes to work at our optimum whether that's individually through you know sort of hobbies and, and sports or whatever it may be um, or also uh, professionally um, and I'm very interested to know what the research says um, I feel very very strongly that we need to use research to inform our practice and our profession um, there's too much uh, what I call shiny CPD out there. Um, for me, it's about being authentic and also about ensuring that we uh, use research and, and use evidence effectively to inform our practice. I should stay at this point as well. Um, what you see is what you get. Um, I'm working in my garage. I'm a little bit uh, paranoid about the background that you, you, you get to see. Um, I've got a house full of children doing their homeschooling. My partner's a teacher, so I'm relegated to my workshop to do these uh, recordings. Um, so please don't judge me on uh, how I dress or what you can see in the background today. Um, I, I, this is as good as it gets, I'm afraid. Uh, but hopefully um, at some point I'll get to meet you all in, in person. 
Okay, so let's let's get started um, with uh, with considering what where we are, particularly with children. I think this is really important. A lot of the work that I'm doing regionally at the moment, uh, and I'm learning a huge amount as well, uh, is some work that I'm doing with Whole School Send, and particularly alongside a gentleman called Ian Hunkin, who works for Sigma Teaching School. Ian has a background as an educational psychologist and a school leader, and we've been looking at the impact that this period of school closures could be having on our youngsters um, as they're they're socially isolated and working in difficult circumstances at home. We feel that the definition around trauma, um, although ordinarily wouldn't be applied, perhaps unless children have experienced particular bereavement or abuse, but we feel that at the minute during this period of kind of sustained instability um, and potentially also experiencing difficulties at home, it's quite likely that many of our youngsters are experiencing uh, elements of, of trauma and the impact of trauma, uh, particularly around the kind of the unknown. So even those children that are in secure homes, just the very virtue of the fact that they're working in very difficult, difficult uh, and different environments at the minute may be placing undue stress on them. So whilst the main focus today is about your health and well-being, I just wanted to explore the context within which we're working. I think we have to be very, very mindful that we have to present ourselves um, to children that will be ex finding life difficult. And as they come back into school and those schools, uh, as you are, are having to kind of manage that transition from home back into school and maintain that social distancing, it's it's compounding this, it's compounding this greatly. I'm going to come back to this chart later, but I think it's it's really important. And this, again, is something that I've I've learned from my work with with Ian. It's uh, it's a it's a theory around um, uh, the sort of polyvagal um, symptoms okay so your vagal nerve is the nerve that connects your brain and your neuroreceptors um, and how you experience interpret the world around you how you're kind of stimulated by the world around you and your physiological response your vagal nerve links your main organs to your to your brain and we all know we've all experienced this before that when we're placed in um, stressful environments we respond to that physiologically we might get butterflies we might uh, feel sick we might lose our appetite um, we might it might affect our sleep it may affect the way we socially interact and this chart kind of shows how we can get bumped up to that freeze or sorry that flight or flight stage um, and at an extreme level over a sustained period of stress into the freeze phase so we'll be working with children that um, have experienced sustained levels of, of stress. They begin to shut down and they can't kind of communicate with the world around them. But even those children that are bumped into that yellow phase there of fight and flight, um, at that stage there, they're not receptive to learning, they're not receptive to the people around them, whether it's parents, friends, um, relatives or, or professionals. And our concern is that many children are in that phase at the minute and will be as they come back into school when schools uh, are, are kind of feeling like an, a, a very different place to the place that they left um, in February, March time. The good news is that through our behaviours and through the work that we can do to support children uh, into coming back into school and even working at home at the minute we can bring children back into the green phase it's at this stage where there's an element of calmness and positivity in a way that um, children can then connect socially with the people around them and also be ready to learn so it's about um, if, if you look at Ian's work uh, and the link later in this presentation it's about working from a place of safety and a place of trust and having those trusting relations but again i'll come back to this with implications for ourselves as professionals as well many of you if you're working in a sporting context or you've or you're interested in um, human performance will have come across um, professor steve peter's work professor peters has worked as a, a psychologist a sports psychologist with 
uh, originally with British Cycling uh, and a number of high performance teams, sporting teams since then. He's written the, the book, The Chimp Paradox. It's a great read. It talks about um, how our brain has evolved um, from our ancestors and that we still retain this kind of um, uh, part of our brain linked to, to, our, to, the, to the apes that kind of responds emotionally to triggers around ourselves without responding rationally. Um, we all have it. It's for me when I present life. I really enjoy presenting life, but the chimps always hopping up and down in my brain, daring me to say something um, that I shouldn't uh, or to run out the door, absolutely terrified. Um, but one of the things that we can understand in terms of children's behaviour is the chimp is 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 the is the controller often of children's behaviour until they get a bit older, and we're a little bit concerned at the minute that the chimps probably having a great time because because life is is tricky for many of our youngsters so we just have to be very very mindful of that we know that children need routine and structure and often that's been thrown out the window uh, at home during school closures we also know that children need social connectivity as do we as as adults um, that's partly around how we construct knowledge and how we interact socially it's also how we manage fear or how fear can be um, triggered uh, during a kind of social uh, environment. But um, particularly at the minute, we know that the children are missing routine and structure. They're missing that social connectivity that they would have at school. And trusting relationships are absolutely crucial. For those of you that have worked with our more challenging children, uh, and it's something that I've done a lot over the years, um, we know that schools are a place of safety for them, for many of them. It's a place where they know where they are. There's that sense of um, place and that is missing at the minute. So all of these things are potential triggers. And I just wanted to pick up on this as well. This is what I consider to be perhaps the pedagogical demands placed on our learners at the minute. We'll know that children have had this massive transition from working at school to working at home. Uh, and managing their own learning. That's the ones that are engaged. Obviously, there's a big cohort of children that we're worried about at the minute that have had no engagement with school or, or home learning. I believe that that has just in itself inherently increased uh, a sense of stress and threat for those children, even those in secure households. There's a demand on, on self-organisation that's not been there before. There's that lack of social support and interaction around those children and a sense of isolation. So when we're delivering work remotely, anything that we do that makes that a little bit more complicated, and it could be something as simple as just an error in an instruction or a, a resource that children can't connect to online, whatever it may be, I think we're very quickly triggering um, a, a kind of sense of fight or flight with children is it's increasing stress on top of all of the additional pedagogical demands. Now that paints a very negative picture. What I would like to say is that I think there's some huge opportunities at the minute in terms of how we work professionally and how children work. Um, the holy grail of metacognition and self-regulated learning. I think we can draw a lot from what children have been able to achieve over the last couple of months. Um, and I think it might help us refocus on some of the pedagogical principles that we know work in effective teaching and learning. And particularly, particularly, sorry, that focus on relationships, professional relationships between ourselves and our students. Um, all of that is for another another session, another time, or it could be something we pick up on the, in the question and answer session. I'd like to uh, just also give you a bit of regional context. Um, in my regional work for Teachers Call Council Southwest, one of the early things that we did was conduct a big survey across the Southwest to understand what the needs were of schools um, and what their priorities were. And that's helped inform the Department for Education. It's been part of a, a regional conversation that we're having with the DfE and the Regional Schools Commissioners team in, in Bristol on what the biggest pressures are in schools. And the top one is staff health and well-being. So um, our school leaders are probably most concerned about their staff health and well-being and also 
people health and well-being coming very closely second and a big concern about how we support our most vulnerable pupils so just to give you a, a sense of where we are regionally and i i would imagine this is a, a national picture as well these are the priorities that your schools have been considering so i'd like to move to the second part of the session I have to record this in one take, um, so I get a bit fidgety. Uh, I can't pause the recording, unfortunately, but you are welcome to pause me and go and make a cup of tea and come back for the second session. But what I'd like to do now is explore a little bit more about um, uh, mental health and well-being and why it's important. I'll be honest with you, um, I find these sessions difficult in a sense that I don't wish to patronise you as professionals. Um, however, I think for all of us at the minute, the, the stakes are high. Um, the responsibility we have to look after ourselves is really, really important as well. And actually, many of the people that I speak to at the minute are struggling to take care of themselves, if I'm brutally honest. Um, and for a number of very, very valid reasons, mainly in terms of, of the pressure to support others, whether that's family members, uh, children at home or others within our uh, professional organisation. But what I would say is that um, I think everything that we know is important in education is magnified at the moment and that includes the importance of looking after ourselves. And if nothing else, I'd like you to consider this. I believe we have a professional responsibility to look after ourselves. That is because if we don't, we are not in a good place to look after those who need our support and need our need our help, which is our, our students and our colleagues. And the research and the evidence suggests that we are not in a place to look after after others unless we look after ourselves first. Also, uh, and this is uh, something that I keep coming back to in a conversation I had with Ian Hunkin, is that physiological states are are contagious. So if we are in a state of anxiety and stress and we're worried about um, the welfare of others, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to present ourselves in that way and children are going to pick up on that and our colleagues are going to pick up on that. So the more we can do to put ourselves in the right frame of mind in order that we can support others, the better we can do our job. So it comes back to that kind of a performance aspect, that human performance aspect, but also, I would argue, a professional responsibility that we have to look after others. Now, I've been given this a lot of thought. I do give this a lot of thought. And, and also, I'm experiencing this myself and, and have done over the years. It takes a huge amount of organisation and it takes self-discipline. Um, in, in the period of time that I've worked at a, a very high level, um, I've realised that it's taken as much effort to invest in looking after myself and looking after other people as it has been to do actually do my job. Um, probably for me, the period that was most uh, informative was trying to do a PhD alongside working full time and having a young family. And I understood just how much effort it took to invest in others and invest in my own well-being um, in order for me to work successfully at that kind of level. I also think uh, routine is important, particularly when the kind of days merge at the minute into one another and we don't have a place of work to go to if you're working from home. And again, this is a, a personal perspective, but I think it's really important to understand the research behind what we're doing. And I'll give you an example of this. If you put um, health, uh, well-being into a Google image search or whatever it is that I use to, to create this presentation, this picture, this background picture is very, very typical of a picture that comes back. So it's somebody sat on a beach in a, a meditative pose looking at a sunset. Well, isn't that lovely? And that is, unfortunately, a kind of stereotypical image that we have when we're dealing with, with well-being matters, that it's a little bit kind of nice and cosy, but actually we don't really have time for it because we're busy doing the important work. But what I want to do is make a case for why this is important, not necessarily sitting on a beach um, doing that, but why it's super important to look after yourself. It's not about working less hard. It's not about being lazy. 
Uh, it's not something that's kind of nice and cozy and doesn't have a scientific basis. So let's just return to the polyvagal chart. I think many of us are holding a great deal of responsibility. Um, we're holding a, an emotional load that could be from our own family circumstances. It could be from the roles and responsibilities that we have uh, professionally. Um, it, it could be a number of things. For me personally, um, I'm worried about my family, worried about my parents and their isolation. Um, and I'm also worried about what the future will look like. And I'm holding on to that. That, that is something that I'm dealing with on a, on a daily, day, uh, day to day basis. And if I'm not careful, it's very, very easy for me to worry. And that worry puts me into a stressful um, physiological state. When I'm in that stressful physiological state, I'm no good to anybody else. I can't look after the people that I need to look for, look after. So I am making a concerted effort at the minute to ensure that I have exercise, that I create a workspace that that works for me, um, and that I take regular breaks. And we're going to look at all of those things as as we go forward in this in this presentation. But what we need to do um, professionally is get to that green phase, that that point where we're we're calm, settled, grounded, uh, and compassionate, and we are able to look after those people around us. I think it's been a real lesson for me to live in the moment, um, particularly in the early days of uh, social, uh, early days of lockdown. The enormity of where we are uh, at the minute is is huge. The way social media has been playing uh, its role in this has has had a detrimental detrimental impact, I think, as well. So, just a reminder that we need to be in this in this green phase where we can. Um, I worked uh, in schools um, as a as a teacher and school leader for twelve or thirteen years. As I said earlier, Midlands in the southwest and and abroad. And it took me a long time when I left schools to work at Exeter University to get used to a new rhythm. It made me realise just how institutionalised. I'd, I'd become. I was used to working to the to the bell, to the break, to the lunch time, to the end of school day, um, particularly for the weekends and even more for the school holidays. And I realised that that rhythm was how my body had, had kind of adjusted. And actually, you know, we all know this that when we get to the school holidays, you know, you get to Christmas, uh, you're exhausted and you get ill. And it's quite common in, in the profession. And what I want to say to you is, is, you know, regardless of our current situation, that is not healthy. That is first aid for our mental health and well-being. And it's not enough. You may have come across this before. Um, I often entitle my training sessions uh, around the idea of the oxygen mask. It's it's a bit tricky at the minute because it has other connotations with COVID-19, but I just want to make this point to you. It's a really, really powerful metaphor. When you're on a plane and you get the safety announcement, um, you are told that the first person you place the oxygen mask in the event of emergency is yourself. Before you look after the people next to you, before you look after your children, you put the oxygen mask on yourself. That is because if you don't look after yourself, you can't look after anybody else. So for me, again, it's a really, really powerful metaphor and I'll keep coming back to this idea. Now, if you are using the PowerPoint alongside the presentation, one of the things that I'd like you to do is watch this YouTube clip of the amazing Arnold Schwarzenegger. He might seem like an odd person to bring into a into a presentation about mental health and well-being, but he's he's on one of these um, YouTube clips that says, you know, the most watched YouTube clip ever. This will change your life, kind of thing. Um, but I think it's really really interesting, and if you watch it. Um, have a think about it. If you've got an opportunity to talk to a, a professional colleague about it, do so. I would normally use this in a live session and get the audience to discuss the, the pros and cons of what Arnie has to say. Um, suffice to say that he has, a, he has an opinion on, on working hard and resilience. 
And part of that uh, idea around resilience is that you become tough through adversity. And, you know, Arnie is a, an incredible example of somebody who's worked very, very hard. He's been able to uh, be successful in another country and work at a high level, both in terms of his acting. Well, I don't know if you'd say his acting is at a high level, but he's been a successful actor um, and a politician. Um, and he talks a lot about uh, uh, having a high work ethic, which I wouldn't argue with. I think it's really, really important to have a strong work ethic. But I am not convinced that really resilience just comes through adversity. I think there's another way of looking at that, which I'd like to explore. So the next phase or the next part of this um, presentation is around strategies. And Arnie talks about um, sleeping faster, how to pack in more into your 24 hours. Excuse me, we've got a jet flying over. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so sleeping faster, I would not say is uh, an appropriate appropriate strategy, um, but I do think that we will uh, consider how important rest and relaxation is. So let's just pick up on this idea about emotional resilience and the importance of caring for others the the research tells us uh, and this goes back to that polyvagal chart that in order for us to be in a position to look after others we need to look after our own physical and mental health um, working with others with mental health issues i've understood the importance of focusing on one thing at a time that importance of downtime the importance of connecting socially um, and it's it's interesting because that's one of the challenges at the minute and our, our ability to socially connect getting enough sleep and the importance that that has and play and having fun and our own opportunities to reflect and, and regulate if you get those right you build emotional resilience okay and that comes from a research basis that doesn't come from just some sort of uh, pie in the sky idea so just to consider those as as priorities as uh, this quote tells you um, and I I'm a firm believer in this resilience comes about how you recharge uh, a good friend of mine calls it topping up uh, it's what you do to kind of top up yourself in order that you're ready to to support others it's not about endurance um, and this this quote this book is a good example of, of, of that uh, that idea um, it, it's particularly difficult now so when I talked about the importance of routines and that um, that that self-organization that that's required at the minute this is about making that time for yourself and one of the uh, one of the other elements of research that supports this is this idea that if we take regular breaks during the day and even simple things about uh, like um, a, a cup of tea and and taking a step outside and having a little bit of fresh air we promote this um, this kind of self-regulation during the day that keeps us in that better place if we push ourselves, and many of us are doing this at the minute, and many of us are, are on the computer too much during the day, and we're not taking those regular breaks, um, we tend to push ourselves into that yellow and, and potentially, and, and this graph, into the red zone. So again, the research tells us that when we take regular, um, regular breaks, self-regulation breaks during the day, we maintain our, our physiological state in a, in a position where we can engage with work and, and those around us. Um, I often set a timer, um, a bit like an egg timer on, our, my, on my computer so that I go out and take a break. There's even research to suggest that physical movement like walking and thinking about work at the time um, is, is a very productive use of time. So um, a strategy I used when I did my PhD was to walk and use my phone as a dictaphone and record ideas. It just gave me an opportunity to take some uh, take to get some perspective on my work, but also use that that exercise and that thinking time. Um, don't feel guilty about doing that. It's a really really important strategy. So 
I mean, this this quote just kind of uh, reinforces that idea that we need to take these regular physiological regulation breaks during the day. Okay, again, um, thinking about the science behind this, I think this can be applied to both children and, and ourselves. And this is about how we can shift our pattern and manage our own um, mental states during a period of, of crisis or a period of stress. One of the things that's um, one of the things that I've picked up on is that when uh, when the environment around us is unstable, um, is is chaotic, we don't have control, um, and and particularly when it's prolonged, we are at our most emotionally vulnerable. When we can move that to a place where life is a little bit more predictable uh, there's less kind of extremes in in the light in in our environment around us and we can gain a bit more control we tend to be able to support emotional resilience now the reason i'm using this is that obviously we are we've got huge question marks at the minute in terms of what the future looks like so we are potentially experiencing chaos um, and if you're a school leader, that's particularly the case. There's been a lack of clarity around government guidelines and DfE guidance guidance that can create that stress. There's a lack of certainty. Um, but there are a number of things that research tells us that we can do to bring um, bring the world around us, I guess, into a bit more of a stable situation, a stable environment. So examples include... Um, daily structure, I've mentioned that before, but our routines, importance of family meals, limiting social media. And I think if you are uh, if you are of the generation, if I can put it that way, that uses social media a lot, I would suggest that you need to be very careful. There's a huge amount in that uh, dialogue that we have no control over. We can't we can't control government policy. We can't control the virus, for example. But what we can do is control our own access to those key messages. I hate the term reaching out, but um, that ability to socially connect is very important. We're going to come back to sleep in a minute. And it's about being positive. And I know that's, I know that's easy to say, but every day at the minute we need to be solution focused. Um, I've just gone through those those eight uh, actions, but they are underpinned by the research of the psychologist Bruce Perry, who's also behind that polyvagal chart. Um, I use this this picture a lot with um, when I'm working with uh, recently qualified and newly qualified teachers. Um, an amazing lady, uh, but the the. The idea of this is that um, I was recently given a book that uh, it's a business book actually that, that talks about the importance of our life uh, and, and old age and how we need to consider um, where we are now and where we want to be in our old age. Now for many of us, uh, those of us who like to live in the moment, um, it's very difficult thinking about our older age but obviously we've got a long time after retirement. and ordinarily when I'm working with with school leaders and and teachers I try and get um, the profession to think about where they want to be um, you know in the latter half of their life we've got a much greater chance at the minute of living to to a grand old age um, and if we push ourselves to the point where we're having an adverse effect on our physical health we're going to experience a long period of poor health, um, particularly when we're not working. And I see too many school leaders who are leaving the profession because of physical health reasons. And really, that that's not good enough. You know, that's not where we want to be. Now, it's up to you how you choose to live your life. Unfortunately, I'm not the best example. Um, I do spend my life living a little bit like this. And this fantastic quote from the poet Hunter S. Thompson. Um, I unfortunately have a uh, an interest in riding, motis uh, riding motorcycles and racing bikes. Um, and what I would say is it's very important to pace yourself. That's where I got it wrong uh, last year. 
and if I'm not careful, I'm going to end up causing myself some serious injuries. So this is this is on my mind all the time. But um, what I'm not trying to do is encourage you to race or ride motorcycles. But what I would encourage you to do is to consider how you live your life and the future. Now let's talk about sleep, um, sleep hygiene. Uh, I don't know why I thought of Top Cat the other day when I was putting this presentation together but when I was thinking of sleep I was thinking about the routine that Top Cat goes through getting into bed and setting putting his pajamas on and, and setting his alarm um, for those of you who have no idea who Top Cat is um, it's obviously again showing my age and for those of you uh, who do know who he is um, you might remember this this kind of little routine but um, sleep hygiene as a term is a term that's only recently um, come across my my kind of uh, radar but when I've looked into this I've realized just how important this is and I and I just um, I'll just add to this um, I've had some of my worst nights sleep during um, school closures and during lockdown um, it's made me realize just how important that routine is, um, how important it is during the day to get some physical acti activity and exercise. It's also made me realize um, perhaps some of the load that I'm carrying and how that kind of plays out at night time. Um, so I think this is really important at the minute. We, do, we just can't get through this next six months unless we consider just how important sleep is. Um, so what is sleep hygiene? Look closely at this image, at this picture. You may or may not have come across this before. It's a little bed for mobile phones. It's a charging dock. It's a place to put your iPad or your phone to charge at night time. Put your, putting your phone and your iPad to bed. Now we're going to come back to this image a bit later on. You might think it's a bit weird. Um, I certainly did. Um, but I'm also going to refer to this this image too. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is a picture of a tachometer. A tachometer is something that, by law, lorry drivers, long distance lorry drivers, have to have on their on their cabs, and it, it records um, how much work, how much driving that that lorry driver is doing, how much time that lorry driver is driving the truck. Um, it's used by law because we know that accidents happen when lorry drivers spend too long at the wheel and don't take a break, when there's a financial pressure to deliver a load and get on to the next load. We don't have tachometers in the teaching profession. Ideally, we'd all have one on ourselves. We'd all have one kind of inbuilt to ensure that we take regular breaks um, and we service and look after ourselves effectively. It, for me, again, it's a really powerful metaphor in terms of how we should be looking after ourselves because we know that a lack of sleep over a sustained period of time can have these health implications everything from heart disease to diabetes to high blood pressure um, pro-inflammatory responses I think many of us in the Western world um, can experience these and the effect that these have on our health on our digestive systems on our moods um, and even extreme things as cancers so I don't want to downplay or dismiss the importance of sleep with a picture of a double bed with mobile phones in it but it's got serious health implications if we don't look after ourselves. So, the bed. Uh, the bed can be used as a metaphor about recharging at night time. It's actually a physical thing that you can buy. So, I don't know if you will have come across Huffington's Post, but it's a, it's a famous publication. And Ariana Huffington was behind that and is a, an executive that's worked at a very, very high level. It's been very, very successful and has experienced blacking out in the workplace due to high levels of stress, resulting in selling the Huffington Post and embarking on a new stage of a career that's focused on the importance of looking after ourselves, so how we look after our mental health and well-being. So you can buy that phone doc um, from Ariana's website. Um, the idea that we use emails and phones late at night, that we're checking in social media, checking our emails just before we go to bed. 
if you're up in the night in the middle of the night you might check your phone it's the first thing that you grab hold of in the morning we've all done it uh, the idea that you've got a physical place to put your phone away from your bed uh, at a certain time in the evening and you don't check it again I think is really really important we need to try and reduce the amount of white noise that's bouncing around inside our heads okay and it comes from as I've said before some self-discipline and some routines another book I've come across recently um, you may have come across the uh, presenter and author uh, Claudia Hammond uh, on Radio 4 she's recently published a book called The Art of Rest uh, it's another great read it's a great thing to have to dip in and out of and talks about the importance in the modern world of how we need to, to pace ourselves and look after ourselves so a few practical tips from me uh, again underpinned by the research many of you will be doing some of this already okay and again I find this really difficult because I do not want to patronize you at all but I think if we can use this as a bit of a reminder it's really important um, you have a choice on how you run your life on a day-to-day -day basis how much news do you read uh, how much social media that you engage with so you choose what's right for you um, but just remember we have an opportunity to push ourselves into that position where we can control uh, the world and the environment around us a little bit. I would say that it's really important to start the day with a routine. I'll be honest, I was one of those people at the beginning that uh, stopped using deodorant, started walking around in my tracky bums. Um, I now start the day excuse me, with, uh, with a shower, a hot shower and then a cold shower. Uh, a shave, I get into some work attire and I mark the start of my working day. It's really, really important. If I can, I'll walk the dogs as well. I'm realistic in terms of how much I can achieve for my work, um, particularly alongside supporting my family and my children, and I've had to adjust those expectations. In the beginning, I found that really, really stressful. Um, I've already made an apology for working in my garage, but uh, I have created a workstation so I have uh, I've considered uh, light sound um, and just considered about the, the right place for me to work um, during, the, during the day and I've also this is another thing that I, I work hard and do and I mark the end of the working day so I'm, I make a point of, of going for a walk or playing with the kids or playing with the dogs I don't have a workplace to drive home for I don't have that drive to decompress and many of you won't either so marking the end of the working day I think is really important and obviously um, exercise eating well living in the mode in the moment taking notice of the world and the environment around us is super important I thought it was really interesting that the beginning of lockdown began at the beginning of that heat wave and I know a lot of people that just enjoy kicking back having a cold beer at the end of the day and you just can't do that every single day you can't do that during a working week um, the relaxing bit is important hitting the beer or a glass of cold wine is probably the not not the best thing to be doing um, I'd like to now talk about um, mindfulness now I'll be really honest with you I'm your, your typical bloke that considered mindfulness as being a bit of a uh, a, a bit of an indulgence that um, that I didn't really understand if I can put it like that and mindfulness and meditation is not something that I've been particularly into or really fully understood but I have learnt during delivering training over the last year or two just how important this is there's a picture of a shriveled up raisin there um, it has a number of uh, metaphors but I actually use raisins in my training because I ask people to really focus in on the texture the smell, um, the taste, using the sensory inputs that you can get from using one simple object um, just to, to live in the moment. I've realised actually that when I walk, um, when I ride my motorbikes or I go for a cycle or I go for a surf or I go for a swim, whatever it may be, I'm 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 being mindful I'm living in the moment I'm being absorbed in the thing that I'm enjoying doing and I forget the white noise around me and the more research I've done the more I've understood just how important that is to free up parts of the mind 
when you use the the PowerPoint alongside the presentation if you click on the link there it will take you to some further um, explanation of mindfulness what we do know and what the research tells us is that um, focusing on mindful mindfulness it doesn't have to be pure meditation but allows us to to focus better it increases calmness it reduces stress it reduces blood pressure it regulates our heart rate okay and if we're talking about resilience it increases the speed with which we can recover from adversity so just let me remind you I'm not coming at this from resilience coming from adversity it's using strategies to keep ourselves in the right frame of mind and therefore um, again being more resilient as a result of that so um, I think mindfulness plays a real important part we have to be disciplined in how we do that we have to build that time we have to create that space if you're caring for others and you've got a house room a house for the kids that you can't li leave and you you live in you know as a single parent or whatever it case may be it's really hard it's really really important to do um, I've come across again from some research that I've done and links to other uh, work that I've been looking at regionally um, some great little film clips they were only short uh, mindfulness and meditation I think the uh, character on the left there is some form of rodent and the one on the right is a hedgehog um, or a porcupine I'm not sure but definitely worth a look at these short film clips available from the PowerPoint so um, I've been talking for a long time now uh, and I just want to go through some concluding comments um, Julia Stewart is a is a regional colleague of mine Julia works uh, in the southwest and does a lot of work uh, supporting school leaders uh, and leaders in, in business as well I believe she's published this book sustaining resilience for leadership and talks about the importance of core beliefs and values agency energy and health and well-being um, one of the things that struck me is that many of us uh, have, particularly because of, of the way we work has changed, we've wanted to continue to support the to support the system or support schools or support families or children, and have that sense of agency. Agency is absolutely crucial. You take agency away from somebody, and you can really impact on their mental health and well-being. I know that many uh, less experienced teachers um, have struggled through a kind of feeling of disconnection from their workplace and that can have a really real impact. You're disconnected from the students if you're teaching remotely. So there is a there is a default for us where we, we just fall into a kind of trap that we need to be working and working and working to support others and not working for ourselves. So just to remind you, you know, I think our values, our, our sense of agency are important, really important at the minute, but they have to be underpinned by this notion that we look after ourselves too. Uh, that book, by the way, is is really, really important. And I just want to you to consider this as well. We talked about the context uh, in terms of where we may find our children and our students. The majority of this presentation has been about how you uh, focus on yourself and your own personal well-being. I want you also to consider the importance of creating that culture of well-being. So what have you done uh, within your, your school to or within your department to focus on the well-being of others in day-to-day -day practice you know if life was normal I would say that this would be right up there with the most important things that you need to consider it's important for human performance okay so there's a there's a there's another element or there's another lens through which this through which you can look at this but I think that given that we work in the education sector and in the public sector we have a moral responsibility to look after each other in my work with the Danish schools and I do a lot of work with um, the Nordic schools the organization the Nordic schools um, and there's a link to a podcast that I've done with Casper Rongsted on this the Danes are really good at just looking after each other it's part of their day-to-day -day practice it's part of their school cultures 
for us it's a bit of an add-on sometimes it's it's a bit of a bolt-on and i think that if it's if you walk the walk at school so it's not just in documentation it's not just in your school improvement plan but over the last couple of months you've been regularly phoning your colleagues you've been talking with them you're allowing your colleagues to express their fears and their opinions and their anxieties that you're creating that open culture that you're visible that you are you're not hiding away if you're a leader or a middle leader particularly that you're very visible as a leader as well and you're being proactive in terms of how you check into each other I think if you're doing all of those things and you're doing them really well now you are creating a culture of well-being and that is going to stand you in good stead moving forward this is part of the positive legacy that we can get through this period so just just in terms of considering um, how we create that culture there I think there's a number of things that we can be doing to engage with others so uh, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail you will get these with the with the PowerPoint but there's a number of resources that either I've referred to during this presentation or others have during my research for my regional work that I think are really really important um, I will shamelessly plug the Teachers Hall Council podcasts at the top there. They're all short, easily accessible, a link to those regional themes that I presented to you at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and I would also just like to pull out there um, at the bottom the work with Ian Hunkin from Sigma Teaching School and also the work uh, that Whole School Send are doing at the minute and their free webinars that are accessible if you, if you connect on those links all of that training goes into everything that I've talked about in much much more detail and it's all free so you can access those as well um, if you missed the live sessions whole school send will let you uh, look at the recorded sessions as well so um, I've spent now how long 50 minutes um, presenting this uh, to you it can be summed up in these five ways to well-being okay so maybe <laughs> Maybe I could have just used this slide. Uh, who knows? Um, if you're on Twitter, uh, then the hashtag teacher five a day is a thing, apparently, underpinned by these five ways. Connecting, giving, taking notice, keeping learning and being active. Now, we would normally talk about these five ways to well-being in everyday practice. I think at the minute it's even more important. Um, so there endeth this presentation um i hope you found it useful and thought provoking i hope you haven't found it patronizing um i do hope that you've got something out of it um the idea now is that you will have viewed this you've got access to that powerpoint and that i will see you in a, in a live question and answer session in july um on the on the date of your conference july the south uh, 7th so i look forward to to meeting some of you there and maybe in the future meeting you all in, uh, in person um good luck to you all uh, stay safe and have a have a great summer thanks bye bye